Okay, good, good afternoon. Welcome back from the, the break. So we, we are continuing with the, with the last session of, the, of today, which is the fourth session. And this is um, also a special session because this session will be uh, live streamed in the, in the UK, in London. So what it means is that the people in the auditorium of the Royal Society of Medicine in London will follow this session but also on the online, on the session will be live streamed. So I would also like to welcome our audience in London and uh, to, the, to the MSF Scientific Day in India. So the fourth session will start uh, with introducing the, the chair, uh, who is Dr. Suman uh, Rijal. So can I ask Dr. Suman Rijal with the presenters to come up to the stage, please? And I'll introduce him, and then uh, uh, Suman will introduce the presenters. Suman Rijal joined DNDI in 2014 as the managing director of the regional office in India. Before joining DNDI, he was professor of internal medicine chief tropical and infectious diseases center at BP Kerala Institute of Health Sciences in Nepal, where he has been a faculty member since 1997. For the last 15 years, he has been working in the field of neglected tropical diseases, particularly Kalazar. He coordinated several collaborative research projects and participated in the development of guidelines for the control of Kalazar in the region. He undertook his medical training in Kolkata, India and the United Kingdom and was awarded a PhD from the University of Ghent in Belgium. He is a member of several national and international committees, including the WHO Expert Panel on Parasitic Diseases Leishmaniasis in Geneva and the Regional Technical Advisory Group on VL Elimination at WHO SAE, that's Southeast Asia Regional Organization. So I welcome everybody and I wish you a good session. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Martin, for the kind words and introduction. I welcome you all here in India and also in, in, in London and around the world who are watching this program to this uh, final session of the scientific program, first scientific program day in, the, in India. Uh, I am uh, pleased to let you know that we have a ex panel of five speakers who are going to uh, present to you on the different things uh, related to Kalaza control. Just to briefly introduce to you, as many of you would be aware, but some of you may not be aware, that uh, India, Nepal, Bangladesh had started a Kalaza elimination campaign in 2005, and with a target to reach this elimination target by the end of 2015, which has been agreed to be uh, in, uh, increased to 2018. There has been quite a remarkable achievements uh, to, uh, to attain this goal, but there are still some major issues remaining. And the speakers today are going to discuss on some of the ways to challenge some of these important issues which still are needed to be challenged. For example, how do we reach our patients early? Uh, how do we uh, manage PKDL? How do we manage HIV VL co-infections? So uh, I would like to start the session by introducing you to the first speaker, who is uh, Manimoy Chakma, who is from MSF. Uh, he has been with MSF since April 2010. He's currently outreach supervisor in a post Kalaza Dermal Lishmaniasis Project in Singh District in Bangladesh. He holds an MBA in management and is studying for an MPH at the American International University in Bangladesh. So he's going to talk to us on the active and passive case detection strategies for control of VL in Bangladesh. Honorable Chair and distinguished guest, um, I thank you uh, everyone and good afternoon. Um, as I am introduced, so I'm going to present today uh, active and passive case detection strategies to, for control bacillus meniosis in Bangladesh. As we know, all uh, Kalazor is a parasitic disease that kills if remains untreated. So, in, a, in other words, is a, a deadly disease also. Um, more than 7,000 cases of uh, Kalazor were uh, reported till 2007 in Bangladesh and 5 to 2007 around 200,500 200, to 3,000 patients were uh, reported from specifically to uh, and Tisha Lopojala. 
postcollagen dermal leishmania cis develops in 10 to 15 percent pigidel patients uh, serve as a source of infection if not treated and pigidel patients usually do not seek care by themselves uh, region um, they are not aware about the disease about the uh, about the reservoir or parasites and more importantly that uh, they are not sick they don't feel sick uh, so they they just everything whatever they do just like a normal person out of 64 districts of bangladesh 32 districts are affected by kalajar and 70 percent reported from myomancing districts in myomancing districts actually Five upazila so sub districts are uh, 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 endemic, Kalajar endemic, which are Fulbaria, Trishal, Muktagasa, Bhaluka, and Gopargaon. Fulbaria and Trishal, which are uh, hyper endemic for leishmaniasis in Bangladesh, contributed 50% caseload. Why did MSF intervene? The conventional treatment was uh, of Kalajar and Pikidel was long and not safe. Um, the treatment was SSG and it was a painful uh, injection collager and also 120 days injection for PKDL. Passive case detection was missing a lot of uh, patients in the community, especially PKDL. As I said earlier that PKDL patients usually do not uh, seek care by themselves because they are unaware about the parasites. If PKDL is not treated, then elimination of collager will not be possible. Project location, this is uh, the map of Bangladesh and this is Mymansing district, uh, Fulbaria Upazela, Trishal Upazela, uh, Fulbaria and Trishal Upazela are neighboring Upazela. Objective of the study was to determine the yield of active case detection in terms of number of cases of BL and PKDL diagnosed and to compare it with that of diagnosed by passive case detection. Method study design, uh, this is a descriptive study type. Uh, it was a professional research. It was done in a uh, program setting. That's why data were collected uh, retrospectively. Study population, uh, all visualized meniasis and PKDL patients uh, diagnosed between April 2010 to uh, December 2011 in MSF Kalazar Treatment Center and also health complex of t -shell. Ethical approval. We obtained ethical approval from MSF Ethical Review Board. It was also approved uh, by Ethics Advisory Group of the International Union Against Tuberculosis and Lung Disease. Permission from the Director of Communicable Disease Control, Ministry of Health, Dhaka, Bangladesh. Results. Uh, I'm showing the results by this uh, bar diagram. Um, case diagnosed during uh, April 2010 to uh, December 2011. Bishar less menaces cases and at the right side, right side is the PKDL cases. So, Bishar less menaces by the active case detection, MSF diagnosed 1087 patients, which was 59% of total patients, and infection area, which is uh, case were reported 756, which is 41% of total patients. And in case of PKDL, MSF diagnosed by active case detection, uh, 1145 patients, which is 97% of total patients. And in three shell, uh, active passive case detection area, only 37 patients were reported, which is only 3% uh, of total patients. And by outreach, uh, MSF did the active case detection by a trained outreach worker team. And in Case of Bishel Lysmaniasis, outreach report 195 patients, which is 18% of the total patients. But in case of PKDL, um, MSF report directly 667 patients, which is almost 59% uh, 59 of the total patients. So this is uh, very clear that active case detection, uh, patients can be found more than the passive case detection. Conclusions? Uh, successful active case finding strategy based on cluster approach. Uh, I should say something about the cluster approach. Uh, in the beginning of the MSF work, um, we started our pro active case detection um, by the door to door approach, but later on we had to switch uh, cluster approach uh, cons uh, considering the and the, the resource.
So cluster, we defined it as um, 2,100 meters radius index case as a cluster. I visited uh, almost every cluster uh, more than three or four times. So an active case detection strategy at the sub-district level uh, resulted in an um, increased yield of Bechelle's menaces and a ha much higher yield of PKDL. Thank you. Thank you uh, for a very nice presentation. I would like to open the floor for any clarifications on this presentation. Yes, please. Could you use the mic? Uh, thank you <coughs> for the very nice presentation. Uh, active case de detection by its very nature, it is definitely going to give increased yield. But to me, one of the questions that lingers is what was the cost per patient identified. So would you be able to... Sorry, it's not clear actually. So what, were you able to estimate the cost per case identified by the okay. case? So I said it was an uh, operational uh, research. So the, we did it in a program settings as a, prog as a program. MSF had uh, uh, own staffs who used to go to the outreach. So it was um, part of the program. So there is no actually a specific cost related to it. Can I have one more question? Yes. Oh, okay. So the second question is in the non the government health program districts. Uh, were these like was there a dedicated program and workers dedicated only for the control efforts? L like you know we have a dedicated tuberculosis program, or was it part of the general health setting over there? Uh, it was actually uh, especially for the uh, for the Kalajar because MSF started working there for uh, Kalajar and before MSF started the um, Kalajar condition in that area was very poor, very very bad. So as I uh, presented that uh, why MSF did inter intervention. So MSF uh, outreach staffs, outreach team who were dedicated to go to the community level and find uh, the patients in the community. And we referred patients to the uh, MSF uh, College Treatment Center. Thank you. Thank yes. you. At the back there. Thank you for the nice presentation. Um, uh, uh, my question is connected to the earlier question, but it's a bit different. My question is that, what has been the sust uh, sustainability strategy? There uh, was there were an, an effort to gave the methodology to the government system to do the active case detection and whether the government um, bought this idea of active case detection in their program. That's question number one. Question number two is just ca ca clarification um, that w uh, I read through the document. Uh, what was the confirmatory test which was performed at the clinic? Uh, it says that the kit was used, uh, the 39 kit was used at the community level. But what was the confirmatory test at the clinical level? So I, I would like you to ask the, answer the second question and the clarification. The first question is very important and we could take it up in the discussion. Which we have. So um, RK39N test is uh, also done in the community by the outreach team. But uh, when patients were self-referred, they came by themselves. Then uh, in the clinic settings, uh, we had a laboratory there uh, they were tested. Okay, thank you very much. Actually, uh, as you know that uh, we, we don't have any vaccine for uh, prevention of Kalazar, and the only strategy we have is early detection and appropriate treatment along with vector control. So this is a very important uh, demonstration that if you have a strategy of active case finding, you will not only uh, be able to take the reservoir out of the community and decrease transmission, but it also has a benefit effect on the patient that they will also have a better outcome of treatment, which has been well demonstrated. Thank you. So, so now I would like to invite the, the spe second speaker, Dr. Vishal Goel. Vishal is a medical doctor specialized in anesthesia. Since January 2011, he has been working as a clinical manager at the DNDI initiative. He has global clinical trials, has a special interest in drug development, and is knowledgeable about the Indian health structure. He has implemented studies for NVL involving government agencies and international partners at primary health center and district level in India and Bangladesh. Vishal is going to talk to you in the next 10 minutes on effectiveness of new treatment regimes for VL in Bangladesh and Nepal. Uh, thank you, Dr. Soman. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'll talk on safety and effectiveness of new treatment regimes for uh, visceral ischemia in Bangladesh and India. 
just to give you a, a background introduction so in last decade we have seen a development of new treatment regimes from exist from liposomal lymphotericin b paramoycin and miltepsin so uh, various uh, new treatment regimes has been developed like combination of paramoycin and miltepsin ambisom so uh, new treatment regime that is combination of paramoycin and miltepsin combination of ambisom and miltepsin combination of ambisom and paramoycin DNDA has conducted phase three clinical trials completed in 2010 on these new treatment regimes, which have been reviewed and then recommended by WHO expert committee and regional technical advisory group of WHO. So they also recommended to do a field implementation study um, at a primary health center level so that it can be adopted into the national program. DNDA uh, conducted two studies on new treatment regimes, one in uh, Bangladesh, another in India. Phase three clinical trial was conducted in Bangladesh to assess the safety and efficacy. And a pilot implementation study uh, was done in India to assess the safety and effectiveness. The objective of these studies was to provide data priorities to provide evidence policy makers for replacing medicine monotherapy, which has been given for 28 days with new treatment regimes and to be adopted in the national uh, Kalazar elimination program. The rationale of this new treatment regime was to uh, reduce the of uh, uh, the treatment uh, depending on the type of treatment like single dose ambisome it's given for one day miltocin uh, permamycin uh, treatments given for 10 days so from 28 days it will be reduced to 1 to 10 days improving the compliance and also preventing the emergence of resistant parasites uh, i'll start with a, uh, a trial done at bangladesh Phase three open label randomized non inferiority study was conducted in Bangladesh from 2010 to 2014. Uh, treatment regimes were miltocin and paramycin combination for 10 days, ambisom and uh, uh, miltocin combination for 8 days, ambisom uh, and paramycin combination for 11 days. They were compared with ambisom monotherapy, their total dose was 15 milligram per kg. This study was uh, conducted in two steps step one and step two. So in step one, 120 patients, they were enrolled and uh, uh, at medical college at Maiman Singh. All these patients, they were hospitalized for 15 days and treatment provided. Uh, uh, the primary purpose of step one was to uh, assess the safety of new treatment regimes. And then uh, this data was reviewed by data safety monitoring board, which gave a green signal to proceed to step two. In step two, uh, three Upzila health centers were identified, Trishal, Baluka, and Gafargao where 482 patients were enrolled. Total of 602 patients were enrolled. Uh, talking about the results, uh, in ambisome group, 158 patients were enrolled. Ambisome paramycin group, 159 patients were enrolled. Ambisome miltepsin group, 148, two patients were enrolled. Uh, paramycin miltepsin group, 142 patients. Initial cure was assessed at day 45. Uh, and uh, uh, in all the treatment groups, except ambisome and uh, miltepsin group, the cure rate was 98%, uh, but in the ambisome miltocin group, the cure rate was 94%. Final cure was assessed at six months, in which uh, cure rate was 98% uh, for all the treatment groups except ambisome and miltocin, uh, in which cure rate was 94%. There was uh, no relapse when uh, during the six-month follow-up period, but uh, uh, this is the conventional uh, period for doing uh, follow-up uh, in VL uh, studies. But then uh, when the uh, sites were followed, uh, it was observed that there were two to three patients that relapsed, but that was uh, between six to 12 months. There was no loss to follow up in the study because we had a dedicated team of field workers who were employed for uh, active case detection for all uh, patients enrolled in the study. Uh, this slide talks about the adverse events. So approximately 60 to 64% of, pati uh, of patients, one adverse event in each treatment arm there were total 12 serious adverse events in this study. Four were drug related uh, and eight were, there were three deaths in that were not uh, related to the study drug and all essays whether related or not related, they were resolved. Uh, to conclude, all uh, these new treatment regimes, they showed excellent safety and efficacy. Single dose ambisome has been already adopted in the national guideline of Bangladesh and combination treatment has been adopted as a uh, second option for treatment of VL. These new treatments, they, they can be safely administered at primary healthcare level as uh, treatment duration, more compliance, and less side effects. 
So uh, ambisome treatment requires cold chain uh, storage of between 2 to 25 degree. So combination regime can be choice of treatment where uh, cold chain cannot be employed. Now I'll talk about a study done in India. It was an open label, prospective, non-randomized, non-comparative, multi-center study uh, done at public health sector from 2012 to 2015. Still, the follow-up is ongoing. The objective of this study was to evaluate the safety and effectiveness when conducted in actual real scenario field conditions within the routine program settings, further generating evidence for the policymakers to adopt the regimes in the national program. This study was done in collaboration with State Health Society Bihar, Rajinder Memorial Research Institute of Medical Sciences based at Patna, MSF. Uh, here I'll mention that uh, at all sites, patients were diagnosed, investigated, and treated by the government, doctors, uh, health staff, except one site, Hazibo District Hospital, where patients were uh, treated by MSF team, where they have experience of treating VL patients since July 2007. In this study, uh, it was conducted in two districts of Bihar, Vishali and Saran. Uh, in uh, Vishali District, Vishali uh, Hazibo District Hospital, single dose ambisome treatment was given. Patients were hospitalized and treatment provided. And uh, five PHCs of Vishali district, ambisome and medicine combination treatment was given for seven days on outpatient basis. In Saran district, at district hospital as well as PHCs, uh, combination of medicine and uh, paramycin was given for 10 days. At district hospital level, patients were, majority of patients, they were hospitalized and then treatment provided. But at the PHC level, uh, treatment was done on basis. RMRI was one of the sites where all the three treatment uh, were uh, uh, given, and mainly the complicated patient they were referred here. Uh, uh, from each side, whether it's for Saran or Vishali at PHC or district hospital, all the six severely complicated patients, they were referred to Hazipur district for receiving treatment, and then they received. Uh, majority of them received single dose ambisom. Total of 1,761 patients were treated in this study. Initial cure was assessed at day 10. Uh, each arm had cure rate of around 99% uh, at day 10. Uh, till date, 1591 patients have completed six month follow up. Rest of patients' uh, follow up is still ongoing. Uh, final cure at six months was 93% cure rate in single dose ambisome arm, 89% in uh, ambisome miltosin group, and 97% in miltosin and paramycin group. Uh, relapse, uh, there were 4.5 percent relapse in single dose ambisome group, 4.8 percent relapse in ambisome miltosin group, and 0.5 percent relapse in miltosin paramycin group. Here we can see that, like I mentioned earlier, so complicated patients they were treated in single dose ambisome group, so maybe having a higher number of. So uh, the national program recommended to do a 12 month follow up of these patients to generate evidence on relapse. So uh, in January 2015, 12-month follow-up was started uh, in this study. And this, uh, till date, it further yielded uh, six relapses in single dose ambisome arm, six relapses in uh, ambisome medicine arm, and five cases of picadale in uh, M plus B arm. Uh, talking about adverse events, so uh, there were around 13% of adverse events, 13% uh, uh, of subjects had at least one adverse event in single dose ambisome arm and 22 to 25% in uh, other two arms. Total, there were uh, five serious adverse events in the study, ambisome group. Two were drug-related and three were non-drug-related. So uh, they were all resolved. Uh, talking about limitations of the study, it was a recommendation by DCJ regulators of uh, India that uh, children should be treated at district hospital level only. And uh, so uh, children, were, they were not treated at primary health center and uh, they were treated at, uh, only adults were treated at PHC level and a uh, higher number of severely complicated patients, they were treated in only one arm, that is single dose ambisome arm. To conclude, all treatments uh, except uh, ambisome medicine group, which had cure rate of uh, efficacy of 94%, they showed excellent safety and effectiveness when conducted within the public health sector setting, within the national program settings. Based on the data, Indian national program, they revised the uh, national policy for treatment of VL in uh, last 2014, in which uh, single dose ambisome was considered as first option for management of VL patients and combination treatment has been adopted for treatment of VL patients. So combination regime can be choice of treatment at sites where cold chain cannot be deployed, maybe in the case of ambisome. There is need for establishment of active pharmacovalence center, public health care facilities and uh, systematic collection of the data uh, at all the sites 
uh, and integration with the national pharmacovalence program. So lessons learned from both the studies is all these new treatment regimes and single dose ambisone, they are safe when conducted at public health uh, sector level. And it is uh, very much feasible to implement these regimes at large scale uh, in uh, conventional uh, doing uh, follow-up is six months and the relapses continue to occur beyond six months. So there is need to follow patients beyond six months, maybe uh, till 12 months to have more evidence. Cohort event monitoring should be strengthened at all sites in India and Bangladesh to document long-term outcome data to generate evidence on relapse, PKDL, and treatment failure. So uh, important thing is uh, there is need uh, to have a gated field workers like in these studies, uh, there were health educators uh, uh, which uh, had uh, which did a detection and involved ASHA workers from the field to do the ensuring less loss to follow up in these studies. So I'll uh, acknowledge uh, all the collaborating partners and uh, uh, special thanks to all the doctors, nurses, technicians, all the staffs involved in this study, without whom this study would not have been possible. Thank you. Thank you, <coughs> Vishal. We have uh, time for one or two questions for clarifications of the study. I have a question from the online audience. Uh, having the single dose ambisome based treatment is already included in guidelines in Bangladesh. Why should the MOH take up the proposed treatment of DNDI? This is someone called Ashish Kumar who is based in Bangladesh. MSF. I think this question is for you. Yeah, single dose ambisome has been already adopted. So we started this study in 2010. So in between the, this was changed and national policy was changed. But we have to complete this study. And then uh, in this study, there were other treatment regimes, combination treatments. So now recently, it has been adopted treatment. They have been adopted as second line option. Uh, thank you, sir. I'm H. Kumar from Energy Media. My point is that I have no question of observation that in the context of safety, health, and environment, one issue is climate change in the healthcare system, that is called ecosystem. And this medicine is there, but the ecological footprint decreases. Jal vayu, jal or vayu. Jab jal bhi sudh nahi hoga, vayu bhi sudh nahi, to how to make the increase in the process of immunization of the body. Should vayu bhi sudh nahi milegi, jal bhi sudh nahi milega, to how to increase. The question is, prevention is better than cure. How to increase the ecological front of the okay. Thank areas. You, thank you, sir. I think we can uh, consider this later on, yes. One last question, please. Shal presented his uh, data very succinctly. Just one question. You said the combination was uh, uh, less superior as, as compared to the single dose. you have any good reason for it? Because two combinations you have used, both appear to have uh, inferior to a single drug, am Ambisome. You used both am Amp and Miltofusin and uh, was it one a randomized trial? Or how did you determine who is severe and who is not severe? So you're talking about Bangladesh study? I think bo uh, other study also you use, no? In the Indian study so also in uh, Bangladesh, it was only ambisome and uh, uh, I think it's a paramilitacin group which had uh, efficacy of 94. Rest all, they were around 98 percent. And uh, uh, there was a study uh, conducted uh, in 2010, so in uh, which uh, phase three clinical trial in which uh, combination treatment they were compared. And uh, efficacy was also 97%. And then the ambisome uh, monotherapy study was done with Dr. Shamsundar, which had efficacy of around 95.6%. In this study, in study uh, being done in India over here, so um, uh, efficacy of 93-94%. And uh, ambisome mildicin group, uh, it has efficacy of 89%. And paramoacin mildicin has 97%. It's less, no? Ambisome, ambisome mildicin, yeah. that's what yeah. I Yeah, it's less. Uh, Maybe, sir, ambisome mildicin, uh, it's like the uh, dose of uh, ambisome in single dose ambisome is 10 milligrams and dose in ambisome, uh, it's 5 milligram per kg plus 7 days of mildicin. Maybe the duration of mildicin, it has to be increased. Thank you. I think uh, there is a lot to ask. I would like to request if you could uh, keep your questions for the last half an hour, which we'll have for the discussions, if you don't mind. So I would like to move on to the next uh, presenter, and it is Dr. Uh, Temi Sunyoto. Temi is a doctor currently working with MSF as a medical coordinator in Delhi. She holds a MPH from the Institute of Tropical Medicine in Antwerp and completed a medical training at University of Indonesia in Jakarta. She has previously worked for the WHO and had worked for MSF since 2005 in numerous countries and settings. She has a special interest in epidemiology and neglected disease and has published on VL. So Temi, I invite you to present on uh, 
and combination treatment for VL patients who are infected with... Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Redaction. So this afternoon, um, as you know, is a session on less maniasis. I would like to bring your attention to one uh, subgroup of the visceral less maniasis patients, or CALAZAR, which are co-infected with the human which HIV virus in Bihar, India, which we have treated with a combination treatment. So uh, I will not repeat what has been said before by Manik Moy, that uh, VL or Kalazar is a neglected disease, meaning it, uh, it has a very limited treatment option. It affects the poorest of the poor in the rural areas. And um, uh, the elimination goal that is in the Indian subcontinent for India, Bangladesh, and Nepal is because actually we found that only one parasite is causing it, the Lesmania donovani, and it's transmitted by a uh, sandfly, the bite of a female sandfly. So, um, as you know, I mean, VL uh, in general, whole world is between 300,000 to five, three to five lakh cases per year, but 90% are happening only in six countries, which is India, Bangladesh, Sudan, South Sudan, Ethiopia, and Brazil. However, we know that even in India itself, not everyone knows about Kalazar because there's only four states that are endemic for the disease. Bihar is actually one of the epicenter. You know, Bihar is uh, one of the massive state in, in India with population more than 100 million people and it contributes to more than 50% of the global burden of VL. So if you look at the number that is reported by National Factor Bone Disease Control Program of India, um, which ranged between 40,000 in 2011, uh, more close to 80% are, are only reported from Bihar. The other state like Jharkhand, uh, West Bengal, and Uttar Pradesh are uh, contributing very small proportion. Um, however, I would like to note as well that this elimination also, we note that in the last, uh, uh, seen a declining trend in the epidemiology, that we see the number from 2011, if you see, was 33,000 reported cases from India, and then it goes down to 20,000 in 2012, and last year was less than 10,000 patients are reported. Now to, to bring to the other side, which is the HIV burden in Bihar itself. This is, as I said before, has a massive population, and it's also uh, out-migration, a lot of people from Bihar are working in other states in India. The prevalence generally is considered as low, 0.2%. However, it's one of the few states in Bihar with the prevalence are increasing. And these are the, the statistics that are officially, officially from NACO, that uh, this uh, number of people of living with HIV AIDS are served with only 14 ART centers. Um, and also uh, they're probably reporting around uh, there's there's between 100 to, to 300,000 people living with HIV AIDS in the state. My apology that actually the first line treatment that are now being used as an ACO guidelines is, as, as we know before, it was uh, uh, Zidofudin and, uh, and uh, TDF, Lamifudin and Evirapin and Fafirin. So this is not correct. Now we'd like to bring on attention why this co-infection is important. So first of all, we don't know really the magnitude of the problem. So there is limited evidence on the prevalence of HIV VL in, in tests that we use are less sensitive and as well they have a atypical presentation because normally Kalazar is have a prolonged fever, splenomegaly and all that which is not always the clinical manifestation subgroup. And also it has been uh, very well established in the evidence that they have a worse treatment response with the options with the with the treatment that are available. So they have higher risk of mortality so they die much more and they relapse much more meaning they have repeated episode of VL throughout their their, their their life, let's say. So there's a recent study, uh, I will come back to that later, that uh, uh, when you compare to the HIV negative patient, for sure the rate of mortality is really much higher. And until recently, they're also known as a high risk group of HIV, meaning the voluntary counseling and testing are not routinely offered to them. And uh, as I have mentioned before as well, actually in India since October 2014, the single dose ambisome has also been adopted as first line treatment for primary Kalazar. However, this regimen is not suitable for this co-infected group because it's, it's kind of low dose. So for the moment in India, there is no uh, national guideline available. They, uh, we, they, they were given the same regimen, which is 20 to 25 milligram per body weight. So. Uh, the combination treatment that I'm going to speak here is actually a combination between 30 milligram of ambisome, so it's divided in six dose, and plus 14 days of 100 milligram of miltafosin. So the objective is to determine the long-term outcome because this is the evidence that I'm missing. What are the outcome in the in the longer term for this particular subgroup? 
So this is an obs observational study, retrospectively analyzing routine program data. We are diagnosed VL using the RK39, and whenever uh, feasible, we do the uh, spleen and bone marrow aspiration. And uh, we do a monthly follow-up of the patients. So this study uh, fulfilled the criteria of uh, exemption of uh, MSF Ethical Review Board, and as well, this, the use of the combination treatment itself has been approved by is in compassionate use based on expert opinion and as well by RMRI Institutional Committee. So when we look at the results here, we saw that, okay, throughout from July 2012 until September 2014, we have 102 patients. Majority are males, and we see that quite high proportion, they, they seek treatment beyond four weeks. Almost half of them already has previously treated with VL with various regimen. They have concurrent TB, and, and, and almost half of them, they know that they were uh, HIV before, meaning they were actually already somehow manage in the ART center and they were referred to us for the VL management. So when we look at the mortality analysis, we saw among the 102 patients, we have 16 deaths. Uh, maybe just to say that uh, the, the mortality at six months is quite high at 11%, at 12 months is 14.5 and 18 months at 16.6%. If you see from the, the graph, you saw that actually uh, there's quite high risk of, of early mortality six months, although later on it reached kind of plateau. is waived by our Institutional Ethical Committee. The, in the past seven years, uh, these are the admission rate, 4459 HIV patients, 408 VL patients, and 24 VL HIV. The VL patients diagnosed to be HIV infected after admission, and almost majority of the patients had previous relapses, most probably five, uh, five Five had five had two relapses, seven had multiple relapses. Look, from 2010, the HIV is gradually uh, blue is the HIV. HIV is gradually steadily decreasing. VL is stiffly decreasing. Whereas the HIV VL from 2010 is increasing and now has reached a plateau. Uh, if you compare the baseline characteristics of HIV VL and the mono-infected VL. I have collected data of a historical cohort of 120 VL patients and compared with the HIV VL, the significant difference you look in the age, uh, in the age, whereas in VL it is 18 years and HIV VL 38 years. And in the spleens, uh, hemoglobin 7.1, it is severely, uh, hemoglobin is low in comparison to significantly low in HIV VL. Mm. And other features like hepatomegaly, liver size, etc. Same. K39 positivity in serum is more than 90 percent. And with RK39 positivity, with the testing with urine, you all know that it can be tested also with urine. It is more. 23 was po positive with 24. 24 count was one. Less than 200 CD4 was in 87.5 percent and two pa three patients presented with atypical features. The predominant clinical picture was diarrhea in two and cop with res uh, respiratory trouble in, 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 in one. And diarrhea not controlled with antiprotozoal, antibiotic and ultimately anti lysmenial drug given to control treatment outcome. Amphotericin B was given a total 20 milligram per kg, 14 patients lyophilized, 10 patients liposomal. End of treatment cured at 96 percent, one patient died while on treatment. HA hurts completion of total dose. It is our policy to give after completion, after control the treatment, infection and then. Another factor is that we are giving tenopovir for HIV. And amputation B is nephrotoxic. Tenopovir is also nephrotoxic. And look, there is one, two patients with respiratory involvement, GI involvement. You give uh, heart, immunity will be raised and IR chance of IR, theoretical chance of IRIS. So our policy is to complete the treatment of VL. It is easy to, uh, to initially cure the patient, then start HIV. And if CD4 rises, then relapse rate will be low. We have given secondary prophylaxis to 12 patients, that is 52%, with 1 mg per kg monthly amputation B. And the result is spectacular. In the secondary prophylaxis group, no relapse, no death. Whereas in the no secondary prophylaxis group, 8 patients relapsed over one year, 
फाइव परसेंट डाइड ओवर वन ईयर तो इट इज डिफरेंस इज हाईली सिग्निफिकेंट सो आवर्स वन ट्वेंटी टू ट्वेंटी थ्री पेशेंट्स वन पेशेंट डाइड बिफोर ट्रीटमेंट At that time, the mean CD4 count was 122. No profile axis group 11. Mean CD4 count was 126. Six months cure rate, that is, end of treatment and follow up for six months. Here it is in the secondary profile axis 12. After CD4 steadily increased from 122 to 180, and what is the problem? And in one year and two years follow up. Mm, CD4 then 378 after two years, after one year, and no patient relapsed. In the no profile axis group, in the six months cure rate three, eight relapsed at least one six months, and within one year multiple relapses in five patients and they died. Amongst them, two stopped ART, and we could not follow up three patients. They are lost to follow up. In Kaplan-Meier analysis, you can easily you can see the graph. There is definite survival advantage for the secondary profile axis group, and with the Cox regression analysis of the of multiple variables, we found secondary profile axis the most robust, most important factor to prevent relapse and death. Baseline CD4 is also important. If you look at the picture, no profile axis group. Uh, CD4 was when those patients were not on secondary profile axis, but CD4 rose after after ART. The CD4 was 175. They did not relapse. Though the sample size is very low, but those where CD4 steadily CD4 steadily decreased from 126 to 100 108, and then no result. Their relapse and death were high. So limitation. Our limitation is that our data was not computerized. Detailed clinical laboratory data of every patient were not available. Some data hence with some data had to be eliminated from the analysis as uh, very few data were available. Prospective analysis, very small cohort size. Some of secondary profile axis may be due to other associated infection because of declining CD4 count. Detailed investigations were not always available. And Burja et al. Uh, they have studied with. Most probably, Sumi Sumi to presented it. 159 patients. We have already seen it. So, what do we learn from this? From my experience, it is increasing. It is deadly. It is deadly. If not deadlier than VL, at least early initiation of ART appears to be promising tool. Along with the secondary profile axis against VL, needs to be considered with seriousness and generation of evidences against opposition of evidences. Those of the eminent physicians, do think secondary profile axis may give rise to resistance because of giving lower dose. But um, we need larger studies to establish our hypothesis. That is a very important tool. As personally, as a clinician, I think giving secondary profile axis giving life to the HIV VL patients. Thank you for your patience. Thank you, Dr. Goswami. Now I open the floor for any clarifications. Uh. So thank you, sir. That was a very good presentation, and it's really a big issue uh, treating the relapse again and again, uh, and uh, it's quite inspiring about the secondary prophylaxis. But uh, the uh, you've not mentioned like uh, the how long did you go with this secondary prophylaxis? Secondary prophylaxis is usually given till CD4 rises above 200 to 250. And it is sustained and maintained over 200 for six months at least. Then we have stopped secondary so, prophylaxis. So you mean to say that after you stopped? That is the reason. Actually, so we have to continue amphotericin B monthly for one year to one and half year at least to try to get CD4 above 200. Yes. That yes. was also the reason why we still go on giving. 5 mg per kg liposomal amphotericin B monthly then the cumulative toxicity will give rise to permanent renal injury yes, yes, yes. thank you sir i think yes, thank you very much now i would like to invite uh, the last speaker of this session uh, dr sakib burza sakib uh, has been involved with msf since 2003 
originally trained as an anesthetist, he now works in public health and community medicine. He has previously worked in Sudan, Gambia, Palestine, Uzbekistan, Afghanistan, and India. He is currently completing a PhD in VL at the Institute of Tropical Medicine at Antwerp while researching the economics of NTD, neglected infectious disease. Sakib is going to talk on uh, PKDL treated with Tristan B. Thank you, Saman. Um, first of all, thank you all for staying. I, I was expecting most of the people to disappear by now, so uh, well done for sticking it out. Um, I'm going to talk uh, today, it kind of fits nicely with the other presentations that we've had. Um, this is one of the subsectors, subsections of uh, visceral leishmaniasis that's not very well known about um, to the general public. As, as Temi was saying, even VL isn't particularly uh, well known throughout India, let alone the world. It's one of those things that you sort of remember from medical school, but not really much about it. It's something to do with the sandfly. Um, and this is something that's even uh, even uh, smaller, so to speak, than that. So, Gideel, um, post-Kalzar dermal leishmaniasis, it's essentially a complication related to uh, visceral infection with visceral leishmaniasis. It's common in areas endemic for VL caused by uh, El Donovani, um, and it's characterized by a skin rash after an episode of VL, although there is some, some evidence of it. Occur it can happen concurrently as well. However, it, it poses quite an interesting dilemma for us because the patients are typically not ill. Um, it's not a fatal disease, and the main issue is that of aesthetics. However, at the same time, it's a based on existing evidence, it's a substantial public health problem. Why? Because it's a major reservoir of El Donovani. So when we talk about elimination, which is something that my colleagues have, uh, have mentioned a few times, in VL that basically means reducing the, uh, the incidence of disease to less than 1 in 10,000. Not to be confused with interruption of transmission, but elimination is a public health problem. However, once we get the numbers down, sustain that level um, at a low level for the next 5 to 10, 20, 30 years. If you have this major reservoir remaining, um, then of course that's going to be very difficult to do. So from the public health perspective, it's imperative that, uh, that we treat these patients. However, at the same time, it's not considering the patients from the aesthetics aren't actually ill. There's a burden upon the healthcare provider to make sure that whatever treatment is provided is a safe treatment with minimal side effects or, uh, or uh, any or compromise for the patient themselves. Now, unlike in unlike in Africa, um, in South Asia, PKDL isn't thought to self-heal. In a, in Africa, what we see the same parasite, um, but we see that uh, about 50% of cases do tend to self-heal by six months after the uh, after the onset. Say in South Asia, if we're looking at interrupting transmission, then we, we do need to focus on, on treating PKDL. And just numbers wise, about 5 to 10 percent of VL cases are, are thought to go on to develop PKDL, depending partly on the treatment used, giving us an instance, incidence of about 4.8 per, per thousand, uh, with an interval of between zero and three years after suffering the initial VL infection. As I was saying, it's, it's really a neglected disease within a ne neglected disease. We, we, we don't really know very much about this condition. We don't know really why it happens. Uh, we have some ideas, um, some in immunological factors that, that are being looked at closer and closer. We don't really know what the pathogenesis, really know what the risk factors are. There have been some studies, but primarily based on the very small sample sizes, it's very difficult to uh, establish any patterns or, uh, or, or causality. Um, to pick on, uh, to pick up on, uh, I think one of the questions from uh, from Vikas, which was uh, about diagnosis. Accurate diagnosis is really a challenge. Um, presently, we don't really have any very very um, sensitive and specific tests. Normally, P um, PKDL is diagnosed by the use of the RK39 serological test. However, this is a test that's, that any patient who has VL will test positive for for different um, uh, periods of time following the infection. So if a patient presents with, with what a lesion that may look like PKDL, but they've had a previous history of VL, their RK39 test may be positive and that doesn't really help you with regards to diagnosis. Parasitological visualization, so basically sampling the lesions and looking at the lesions under a mi looking at the, uh, um, the sample under a microscope is the gold standard test. However, for the majority of lesions, which are macular lesions, basically, I'll show you some pictures in a minute, uh, the sensitivity is very, very low, 30 to 50 percent. 
and, requ and most importantly, it requires experience and, and skilled human resources, which aren't available in the majority of this, um, the sites, and certainly mm -hmm. not in the public in the in the primary at the primary healthcare level. Um, secondary to this, uh, the there is very little evidence on management. We don't really have any idea about how well the drug the current drugs used for visceral isomeriasis, of which there are very few, how well do they penetrate the skin? So when it comes to estimating doses, duration of treatment, it's really just, just guesswork. Um, how much does a, a, a drug injected uh, intravenously, how, does it access the, um, uh, the epidermis? The same thing goes for uh, oral drugs, topical drugs as well. There's also no evidence on the end point of treatment. We, we don't know when to stop treatment. We know that after some time, usually between one to three months, there is a response uh, following treatment. But obviously, um, wait for complete clearance of all the lesions? Do you wait for partial clearance? Do you wait for, the, for a biopsy to show no, uh, um, uh, no parasite? We don't really know. Some pictures here uh, about just to kind of show you what the what Picadia looks like. Uh, this is this is the macular form. Basically, look very easily confused with vitiligo. Confused can be confused with uh, leprosy as well. The difference being that uh, you have some sensation. We have uh, papular lesions here, slightly raised lesions, um, which are more disfiguring. And then finally, we have nodular or tumorous um, tumorous lesions here. Um, if you actually look at the back of the very back page of the uh, of the scientific day guide, you can see a nice picture of a, a, a lady who's uh, who pre and post treatment. And this here is the same patient that you can see how how the, once the lesion resolves, how it looks. So. What is the ex I'm going to focus now on the existing evidence for PKDL. Um, what is the existing evidence? Essentially, in South Asia, there's only one randomized controlled trial to date, comparing oral miltefacine 100 milligrams for eight weeks compared to 12 weeks. The uh, the result was that uh, 90, well, it was a 93 percent cure rate at 12 months. However, this was based on a sample size of 15 cases. No children uh, were treated, no macular PKDL, which forms the vast majority of cases, and there was no safety data post four weeks. In addition to this, considering it being a very aesthetic condition, um, a lot of the people who, who self-present for treatment are females. And in women of reproductive age, you need for the, to have this treatment safely, you need to ensure contraception for above seven months. And of course, for any treatment for that you're giving an oral treatment for 12, many of us take treatment, complete a, a course of antibiotics. Taking oral treatment for 12 weeks is also a, a major issue, and it may lead to resistance. Essentially, the, the regimen poses high direct and indirect costs, both the patient and the healthcare system. So, what did MSF? What was MSF's approach? Um, it's really started in uh, the, the use of Amisom in PKDL started in Bangladesh. The diagnosis was. Uh, clinical, so we weren't doing uh, p uh, samples and microscopy as a, as a standard, essentially clinical symptoms, i.e. the rash or the lesions, a history of VL and a positive RK39 test. Treatment was, uh, was given with 30 milligrams total dose ambisome, that's six doses of five milligrams twice a week in an ambulatory fashion. Initially given in Bangladesh, um, they treated, I think, 2,000, 2,500 patients and then started in India after a, a, consul a WHO consultative meeting uh, in 2012, recommended it as a treatment option. However, subsequently, the, uh, the, the treatment in Bangladesh was reduced to 15 milligrams um, based on some safety concerns, which we'll talk about in a minute. As I say, it was an ambulatory treatment over three weeks, so patients could go home and come back in to receive their treatment. And uh, the endpoints were uh, was at 12 months, whereby uh, patients, photographs of the patients and the lesions pre and post treatment were uh, were taken, and then assisted in validating the uh, the scoring from the uh, from the clinicians themselves. In particular, safety data was monitored monitored closely, particularly uh, hypokalemia, because of reports of rhabdomyolysis from the larger cohort that was initially treated in Bangladesh. So just to give you some examples of the well some details on the on the on the types of patients that we saw as as you can see it's 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 quite interesting we in in in, in we have 97% of patients in in Bangladesh presenting with macula that's the uh the uh, vitiligo type uh, t type condition um equal spread between males and females and to the patients had ambisome uh, as as a previous treatment for their for their VL prior to developing the condition and the average uh, onset of symptoms, uh, the median was six, with a mean of uh, 15 months. In Bangladesh, it was quite. Sorry, in India, it was quite different. Uh, we had a, a lesser, a, a lower um, prevalence of, uh, of macular uh, PKDL with much more mixed morphology. 
Um, the average age was younger. Uh, we did see a, a higher number of females. Um, and the, 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 the treatment of, of choice, let's say prior, the, history, the historical treatment for VL was, uh, was, more, was SSG above all of the other treatments. And the, uh, the median time was slightly shorter to presentation. So looking at effectiveness and safety outcomes at 12 months, um, to, so far 50 patients have completed the 12 month follow up. Of, of these 84%, 42 patients showed substantial or complete cure. In Bangladesh, of the 88 patients completing 12 months follow-up, 80% showed substantial or complete cure. However, there were some safety concerns raised in Bangladesh. Now, we're not really sure why, but they weren't seen in India, but they were seen in Bangladesh. There was, there was a, a, a concerning incidence of a severe hypokalemia in the Bangladeshi cohort that we didn't see in, in India. The same thing went for, the, uh, for, for mild and moderate as well. Fortunately, none of these patients had any other sequelae. None of them developed rhabdomyolysis, and all of the hypokalemia resolved without incidence. However, uh, reflecting the safety concerns in Bangladesh, the treatment was switched to 15 milligrams per kilo. So this was a prospective observational study, um, uh, the primary objective of which was to evaluate the effectiveness of the, of the new regimen at 12 months, uh, 3 milligrams per kilo given in five doses over two to three weeks with a particular focus on safety, specifically looking at hypokalemia, and looking at the point, at which point in time did the lesions start to respond to treatment. A good sample size, 175 cases, is, is, is as you, if you speak with any people from anyone familiar with PKDL, it's really quite a large sample size. And here are the results so far, as of March 2015. We don't have the 12-month results yet. That, that data collection has just started. But 73% of patients showed a substantial or complete improvement by six months. Definition of substantial is between 80 and 99% improvement, um, and uh, complete, of course, is 100%, complete clearance of lesions. Excellent safety data, no severe adverse events or severe hyperkalemia. There were some adverse events which are quite common to ambisomes, such as lower back pain and shivering, but, uh, but, but nothing, all of which resolved uh, by themselves. As I say, 12-month data collection has already started. Number of limitations with a study, um, with the studies. Um, it's very difficult to standardize assessment of improvement. Patients have lesions on their hands, their arms, their legs, their faces. So each part, each, each part of the body resolves at different speeds. In addition to that, some people, uh, some clinicians choose to uh, feel that the, class the classification of complete cure should be when you have complete repigmentation of the lesions, where others feel that actually when you show a substantial amount of resolution of the lesion with, with no parasite on biopsy, that, could, that can be defined as a, 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 a cross-checking of the clinician's decision-making. There was some regularity in the quality of the photographs in the 30 milligrams per kilo group. However, this was improved in the 15. And of course, finally, the inclusion was clinical assessment based. So if you did come in to have your parasite, if you did have a, a, a skin biopsy and there was no parasite, it did not preclude inclusion. So there, there is a possibility that no, a number of the patients didn't actually have PKDL and had other conditions. So in conclusion, 30 milligrams per kilo appears effective in the, in the treatment of PKDL. Seems to be safe in India. We don't know why, but it has shown safety concerns in Bangladesh. However, 50 milligrams per kilo appears safe, tolerable, and showed good adherence in, uh, for these patients. Um, the effectiveness appears to be similar to the higher dose, pending the 12 months results becoming available. And essentially, there's an, an urgent need for course treatment um, options for PKDL. Ambisome can be tre treated, uh, can be considered an option in this case, um, with a caveat that it still requires the uh, the more difficult administration. And of course, any monotherapy being given for, for a condition PKDL um, is uh, runs the risk of developing a uh, uh, resistance and uh, that's it. Yeah.